young men of color come up from the gloom of national neglect you have already been paid for come out of the shadow of irrational prejudices you owe no racial debt to history the blood of our bodies and the prayers of our souls have bought for you a future without shame bright beyond the telling of it kwanzaa means access it means access to your soul it means access to your people kwanzaa is like renewing your annual membership to community, to your family, to your culture, and most importantly, to yourself. Kwanzaa is expressed throughout the world now by people of African heritage who want to have that cultural connectedness. These are principles of what we're supposed to be doing 365, you know what I mean, and how we treat each other and how we look at the world. We did not petition or ask for permission to celebrate. We did it by Kuji Jaku self-determination. Lead and Flint and proud of us. I'm Sophia Taylor and I am made right here in Flint, Michigan. Born and raised, rehabbing the hood and I'm proud of it. This is Gary Jones coming to you live from downtown Flint and I'm made in Flint and proud of it. My name is John Wood. I'm made in Flint and proud of it. I'm Laura Paddock. I'm making it in Flint and proud of it. I'm Molly Paddock. I'm born in Flint. I'm making it in Flint. I'm staying in Flint and I am proud hey, of it. Hey, Dwayne Younger, chilling out down here at the Bucket Valley Fest. Made in Flint and proud of it. Sherman Marable, creator of Student of the Month, and I'm made in Flint and proud of it. I'm made in Flint and proud of it. Made in Flint and proud of it. Made in Flint and proud of it. Hi, my name is Shandrika Moore, and I go to Evangelist Temple Church. Made in Flint and proud of it. What's the best decision you can make for your business? Your membership in the Flint Area Chamber of Commerce is the best investment that your small business can make. The GCBA wants to encourage the young, lost entrepreneurs to get up off the bench, to join the team, and put their business ideas to work, to start filling those empty storefronts, and start filling those empty businesses. Hi, I'm Ryan Ishu with Remax Real Estate Team, and Flint's future is looking so bright, I have to wear shades. Visit us online, flintareachamber.org. Your membership helps us develop a strong, united voice for the business community. Building a better Flint and Gen I'd like to call this meeting of the Flint City Council to order. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Ms. Popola. Present. Mr. Nolden. Present. Mr. Freeman. Here. Mr. Lawler. Present. Mr. Neely. Present. Mr. Sargentson is absent. Mr. Kincaid. Here. Thank you. Okay. I'd ask Councilman Freeman to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Please all rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilman Freeman.
Madam Clerk, are there any um, special orders or unfinished business at this time? No, Mr. President. Are there any additional communications from the administration to be placed on file? Not at this time. Okay, now's the time set aside for members of the audience to address the City Council. <clears throat> The clerk will call your name. Please come to the microphone. Give us your name for the record. Limit your comments to five minutes and refrain from any personal attacks on individuals or institutions. Madam Clerk. The first speaker is Mr. Craig Smith. Mr. Craig Smith. Good evening, Council and Chamber people. Good evening. I want to talk a little bit about um, the six mil millage increase that was voted on. It equates to $5.3 million. And according to Dane Walling, that's a figure of uh, approximately $79 per household per year. Um, what's been frustrating to me is that some of the people that supported this originally did not make a commitment that these would all go to public safety people and using the 5.3 million at a at 100,000 per uh, public safety official would equate to 53. And if you use a number of around 75,000, which because of imposed sanctions or reductions that were given to the unions, that would equate to about 70 public safety officers. Uh, I know Mr. Kurtz stated prior to the election that he would continue to fund 55% of the general fund to public safety. And I would think that this 5.3 million is going into the general fund. Uh, since the election, he now has been quoted in the Flint Journal saying that adding 10 public safety officers would be fiscal irresponsibility. Uh, I'm opposed to that. I know that some of the figures now being thrown around are that five officers are retiring, so that 10 number would really be five. Uh, I don't know what the plans are for this money, but I urge you council members to make sure that it goes to public safety because this is what the people of this community voted for. I also want to talk a little bit about water rate, water bill increases. It's near and dear to everybody's heart. And if you look at the numbers, most people have a $50 per month at least, or $600 a year increase in their water bill. If you use these same numbers that Walling has given on a millage of $79 per household, if you equate, divide that into 600, then that means the water bill increases equates to about $40 million. And I don't know where all that $40 million is going. I, urge you people to investigate and see where it's going, but I don't think that that's, that we've got a $40 million increase from uh, the city of Detroit. Also, it's being told, and people down to water department today, waiting in line, we're talking about how they're being overcharged, and they're reading their, their meters and getting credits because uh, the city is actually overcharging people to increase their revenue so that their bond rating is higher. These things are all frustrating to me. I also look at the Smith Village project. And approximately 18 months ago, I stood in front of the chamber and I talked about how you wouldn't keep the thieves out of there, that they would steal everything that was in these houses. We've lost appliances, electrical, and a lot of other things in these homes and now money has been allocated to repair those. These houses, some of which were supposedly going to be occupied last January, still sit unoccupied. Uh, now we're at our third contractor, at least three, and TV12 the other day reported that all the front porches have to be removed because they're not up to code. And I don't know what that cost is. Uh, the other thing, this new contractor, I, I, I did a little investigation on the computer. I don't know if my facts are true, but I think that this company originated in June 15th of this, this year, and they were awarded a contract on the 1st of July. But in essence, 
I'm just urging you council members to make sure that public safety millage goes to public safety. I'm urging you to look at the water bill drastic increases that all of the people in this community are suffering from and making sure that it is spent where it's supposed to be spent. And I guess I don't see how we can have an unbalanced budget for this year if we've got $40 million in water bill increases and we've got another $5.3 million from the millage, and yet we have not cut one city employee administrator in the uh, past year that uh, uh, we've been under an emergency financial manager. I know uh, Mr. Brown last January talked about cutting $650,000 out of the budget, but when you look at his salary and a reinstatement of some of those officials and all of his appointments and the master planner, the uh, super chief, and the increase, pay increases with Alvin Locke, that all equates to about a million three. Mr. So, Smith, your five minutes. Okay, thank, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Mr. R. L. Mitchell. Mr. R. L. Mitchell. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Carl. Uh, my name is R. L. Mitchell. I live at uh, 3512 Mildred, and I got another address, too, thanks to the slum landlord. It's uh, 759 Linden Street. And uh, enough of that, because Scotty, remember the last time I was here, I was saying that uh, I, was, I worked, I'm employed at Chevrolet Truck Assembly on Vance Lake Road. They worked, they worked me like a Hebrew slave for seven, six years. And, uh, and I was saying that to say this, I couldn't say much about Chevrolet and Buick, I mean Buick over on St. John Street, because they gone and my plant is still there. But I'm trying to say they be dictating stuff in the president's with running for president, it took, and you, with these dictators, what try to dictate you and Flint. And I was voting, I was, that's why I was vote absentee violence to make sure the president get an election. But I found out that was a dictator thing too. Governor Romney, Romney, he giving everybody pink slip because he lost and run, trying to wonder where the money went. And, uh, and I was hoping that you wouldn't, I see you ain't no, nobody can dictate you, but I was saying that to say this. I went, my significant other, I got her to vote for the first time in life. She just turned 41 years old. And I believe she was, she, she voted for Obama, but she thought, she always tried to dictate. Man, I'm almost, now look here, Scotty. I'm almost out of breath because Josh asked me how was my Thanksgiving dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. And she always sent me to the store to get some milk, but the store don't know have no milk. And when I come back, the house full of people, and they be saying, who's the dude on the couch? And she said, that's my God, brother. But every time I try to talk, she won't let me talk because these dictatorship people talking about Egypt. This dude running Egypt and shooting scut Moses at the Holy Land. And every time I, they say, if your God, brother, wanted to let me speak about this. And then one lady talking about, he coming back, the king of Jerusalem coming back as a woman, and she said, you say something, that's that dictate, and I'm getting, really, man, the, I was finna say the hell with all this stuff, I'm finna, I mean, people like us sit idly by and let, and let people dictate people, and don't say, I heard in the, the black book said, if these don't say that the rocks just talk for them, ain't nobody gonna talk for me, I do, I don't care for him, or, or Chris, man, I can't have they talk now, you looking like, Somebody said to, something to you, and then you act like Greg Easton, and then threatened you to. Anyway, Greg Easton, Merry Christmas to y'all all, and Happy New Year. When it, that's the word from Greg Easton. Thank you, R.L. Clerk, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Leon L. Alamin. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Leon Abdullah Alamin. 
I'm here with some of my 3R Urban Reality members, a propagation and community assistance organization established to help bring about balance in community life. I am reaffirming my nominee for the first ward city council position in which I submitted with Ms. Brown. <clears throat> in my 32 years of residing in this ward, and my family residing in this ward for over 45 years, I have never seen it in the condition that in which it is today. <clears throat> Where vandalism, blight, and abandonment has become so rampant, and generations of my grandparents and grandparents of those who I know are in fear. They need want to stay outside on the porch and watch their grandchildren grow up because of fear of violence, bullets coming through, and other vicious crimes that's going on in this ward. <clears throat> when the majority of the youth in this ward have become lost in dealing in drugs, sex, and violence, an uncaring generation thinking that there's no consequence for their behavior, I can't stand by and not speak out on against it or say nothing about it. Having a passion for my city, I stand here today saying that something has to come about, some, some kind of dramatic change. I know we are in a situation dealing with financial manners, managers and so forth, but something has to change. And I come to represent that change. Having the opportunity to work with Councilman Lawler, speaking with Ms. Poplar a few times and working consistently with Mr. Nolan, Vice President Nolan, on issues and dealing with and bringing a bridge between the youth and, and individuals of my age and generation to come up with solutions, to work about bringing solutions for these problems that we're dealing with. We see um, some development going on downtown, but continuously the north side being neglected. And I don't think that's a fair balance. And we need to continue to address this. I have also, me and my organization has worked with Mr. Um, Woodrow Stanley, former Mayor Woodrow Stanley, now State Representative Woodrow Stanley. And we invite all of you. We have another meeting coming up December 3rd at 10 a.m. at the Golden Gate Restaurant on Fusher and Ballinger, in which we have come up with a, a proposal and a bill to assist individuals, ex-offenders, in which I represent an ex-offender as well. That's a game-changing event for this state. And I invite anyone who's, who's able to come and attend this meeting. I just love my city, my roots out here, my family in that ward for over 45 years. And to see it in the condition that it is now and also other areas of this city. I believe it's time for some changes, some new ideas, some fresh blood, some individuals, people working with, with you guys and you guys working with the community to bring about such a change. And I'm reaffirming my my, my letter of intent for this war to come in and assist and to help you guys in any way that I can in my organization, some of my members are here as well, in any way we can because we can't continue to move in the way in which we're moving. I know um, the mayor in you guys' position, power has become shrinking because of what the governor has did with these financial managers, some of us like to call little dictators, but in any kind of way, you know, it's, 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 adapt, it's, it's, it's a strategy, excuse me. It's sad to see the democracy of Michigan going the way it is, being destroyed the way it is. And me and my organization, a lot of individuals are, are pretty much fed up with it. So I'm here today just to reclaim my submission for that first war position and to just seek out any ideas and help you guys may have to assist us in regards to bringing about this change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, real quick. Councilman Nolan, um, I, I, I want to appreciate uh, Brother Leon coming up and speaking. I have been working with him, and the, um, the proposal that they're going to be um, submitting to um, 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 Representative Stanley is an outstanding proposal. They've, they've done their due diligence in researching and looking at um, different states and different cities and what they've done as it um, relates to um, the ex-offenders program and the recidivism of um, 
um, ex-offenders, you know, returning back to, mm -hmm. to life of crime. So I do applaud Leon um, for, um, for his action, and we're going to take due notice um, as relates to um, what you're seeking as a first ward uh, person. Okay. So, you know, uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on, but we do welcome to look at your, uh, your application, and we're going to give you uh, a fair chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I do hope when uh, Mr. Stanley goes before his colleagues in the state that they have the heart, as the citizens of Flint do, for the um, convicted felons. A lot of um, people that don't understand and maybe don't have this type of person in their family, they just seem to push it to the side. And I know the state, on one hand, you have Democrats, and on the other hand, you have your Republicans. And hopefully the two can come together and try to help um, bring about a change with convicted felons. Because a lot of these um, young people have made a mistake, and everyone is entitled, I believe, to a mistake. And um, for you never to be able to get your life back on track, that's an atrocity within itself because you fall back into that same old game again and then you go back to where you were sent and locked up. My brother happens to be the prison warden of the largest prison in the state of Michigan and he's even trying with the new inmates. He said these are nothing but babies that are coming to him. And um, something needs to be done once they get out. He said a lot of them, the lesson has been learned. It's been a hard lesson. And he's worked with them because he's also an, a counselor. And um, I just hope that the state of Michigan can come together and help these young men and the older ones that are coming back because they're sending them back into society. They're sending them back to their families. And they haven't been here for a while and it'll be an adjustment. But once again, you have got to work together and hopefully Mr. Stanley can get his uh, colleagues. I know he has um, Jim Ananak who he works well with, and um, probably some of the others from Detroit. But once again, it's not going to work if there's not a working relationship between the two parties. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Mrs. Marjorie Scott. Good evening. Can Good you evening. hear me? My name is Margie Scott. I live at 401 East Moore, and my problem is the United States Postal Service. Lately, I haven't been getting my bills on time, and then the bills that I do get when I mail my check back in, they're not getting a check at all. And so they've been calling me on the phone saying they're not receiving payment, and they want $30 uh, late fee, and I don't know what's going on at the postal service. I went up there to tr talk to the, well, whoever's over it, up on North Saginaw Street, and I haven't got any results, and I'm not going to keep paying late fees for something that I'm not sending in late, and I was coming down here to see if there's anything possible that you can tell me to do to try to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you. The congressional offices, uh, Congressman Kilda's office, yeah. whatever. Yeah, I, I guess my, my referral to, to you would be to contact Congressman Kilde's office. Mm -hmm. I know they're getting ready for transition right now, but there's, there's still someone in the Flint office, and, and you may want to contact Congressman Kilde's office. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Mrs. Rosie Mays. 
Mrs. Mays. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Rosie Mays. I live at 125 East Russell here in Flint. And I'm here uh, for the specific reason of addressing the city council. Some of you I know personally, and some of you I just know, and maybe you know me. But I notice every time I come to city council meeting, we do the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, which is proper and in order. And I love my country. I love my state. I love my city. I love all of you. Some of you I know personally, I can't tell you everything, but I believe that all of you are Christians. I believe that with all my heart. And the first thing I want to do is commend you on doing whatever you can for the city of Flint. And I know that your hands are tied somewhat, and I know you can't get a lot of stuff done. There's a lot going on in the city, and I would like to see it just happen. But I just want to quote something, because I'm a Christian, and maybe I'm out of order when I say this, but I just want to quote something that I believe will work in helping you. I don't know the answers. I don't know how to get to the answers. I, if I was sitting up there in some of those seats, I couldn't tell you from not a clue as to how to solve some of these problems. But I believe that this could help a lot. There's a scripture in the Bible that says it's from 2 Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. It said, if my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves, and I know all of you know what humble means, and pray, and turn from your wicked ways, and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven. God said he'll hear you, and he would solve your problems, and he would heal the land. And once you get that notion and do that, because the Bible is right. It's, it's, it's not wrong. I don't care what nobody says. The Bible is what it says. And God is in this business. And I just want to put on everybody's mind, because I'm sure most of you, or maybe all of you know this. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart, I mean all of it. A lot of us got a lot of knowledge. We've been to school. We've educated. We've got sense. We know how to do things. And if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, he will direct your path. He'll help you solve these problems. He'll give you the right direction to go in. I want to see Flint come out of this turmoil we're in. I want to see Flint strive to be what they can be, because you can't be that. We need healing. We need God in this business. I used to believe a lot of times what they said about church should be separate from state. Not so. In the Bible, God sent his messengers everywhere there was a problem in politics back in the Bible. And he solved them. You just have to follow his direction. So I'm just here to remind the city council members to please Look to God, do what he says, follow his direction. And the last thing I want to say is this. I have a son that you all know, Eric Mays. Now, Eric and I don't agree politically on everything. We have our disagreements about a lot of things. But one thing I do know, and Eric knows it too, I'm going to tell him what the Lord say do it. I'm going to follow that. He might not do everything that I say, but I believe, I believe in my heart that he, if he's appointed that position as first ward city councilman, you'll have a person there that's going to help the city of Flint. Now, that's just me. I'm not saying that because I'm his mother. I'm saying this because I believe that. God said that to me. So, city council members, Sister Brown, Sister Jackie, Brother B.B., Pookie. 
<laughs> Mr. Lawler, Mr. Leary, and I don't know this young lady's name, but I want you to know I have a lot of confidence in you. And I believe that you're going to help this city turn around. And I believe that Flynn is going to be it, but you got to, you got to put God in it. You got to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, Councilman Lawler. Ms. Mays, I just want to thank you for coming forth and sharing that godly wisdom and encouraging words. Uh, that's refreshing, and we need that. We need that type of uh, encouragement. I need it. I'm not going to claim it for everybody else, but it, it did do me uh, some good. So thank you for that. Uh, Councilwoman Poplar. Yes. I, Ms., Mrs. Mays, you know you and I, we always talk when we see each other, wherever it is. And you know I've always loved you to death. And I've never held your son against you. <laughs> But, um, and I understand what you're saying. That's why when I do what I do, I do it with such a clear conscience because I look to the hills from whence cometh my help. And I know all of my help comes from the Lord. Not only that, Every vote I take, every statement I make, every step that I take, I know I can walk, I can talk, because everything that I do, it comes from the Lord. And he gives me the strength, and he will see me through. So when I go to sleep at night, it ain't because I've done something wrong. I said something wrong, it might be because arthritis is on me. That's the only reason. Because I know where my strength comes from. I've been through the fire and certainly been through the storm. That's why I'm still sitting here. Because he allows me to sit in this seat. But thank you, because there's nothing in the world more better than a godly woman. Bless you, Miss Mays. Thank you, Jackie. Anyone else? Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Eric Mays. Yeah, my name is Eric Mays. I almost didn't say nothing behind when Mother spoke, but I changed my mind. I will say something. I was surprised when I found out that Del Rico had resigned because I can remember that appointment process a little while back and I was involved in that and I can remember some maneuvering as it related to Johnny Coleman and others and I didn't know Del Rico from Adam, I had just met him and I talked to some council people and. I'd say, okay, you can't get the votes, let's go with that. We'll look back and see how it's assessed. I don't feel bad one way or another if a person resigns, and I don't feel bad about any type of recommendations from that person. I called the UAW and I talked to some people, and I believe my UAW brothers tell me the truth. Del Rico made a personal recommendation. Ms. Poplar, uh, I know you and my mother got a good relationship different from mine, but we went through a process of, a political process during the Obama election, this last election cycle. And I seen a whole lot of people working together. I had never seen it in 20, 30 years. And we was fighting the emergency manager public act for and for the first time I called you and you answered. And I called you a second time and you answered. We all worked together then and we did a good job. I heard you on the radio this weekend and I would say to you that 
regardless of who talked to who, because I've been in politics 20, 30 years. I've made commitments, and then sometime I have to go back and talk to the people I talked to and change them. I'm hoping that God got his hand down in the middle of it. For the first time in the past election cycle, I sit up at the pulpit with preachers at House of Prayer, and I was the only one sitting in the middle of preachers. I say then, God's got his hand in something. I've talked about jobs and bottled water. Howard Croft come to me today, Mr. Neely, he says it's an empty building out there. Jeff Wright says they bottle an Aquafina and they employed 500 people in Detroit. You can distribute the water we sell all across the nation and pull a dollar back a bottle. You can generate revenue. I don't want to see a demographic type appointment, not at this time. We did a demographic type of appointment. They say we need a young person. Now, Mr. Nolan, the guy who spoke, before I want to see any backroom deals or any commitments made prior to the public applying, I would ask you, if it looks like that, I want it, I can help, I know what I can do. You need legal help. Look at that seat empty. Ms. Poplar, we back in court Wednesday at 3 o'clock, Judge McKay. The Lord is in it because I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to beat the city attorney Wednesday and show you that I understand law better than that man. I would give up what I want bad and recommend that guy or Harry Ryan because I don't like things that's not transparent. I like transparent, open government. And I can tell you this. I thought I wasn't going to qualify. But guess what? Everywhere I look, I can qualify. Del Rico can move out. I can move back in. If it's different, somebody show me and I'll step out. But I've affected my qualifications. The charter says you ought to be a registered elector in the district. Soon as I said I want it, the first thing, do you live there? I'm qualified. So here we go. I pray and hope that y'all let the first ward form happen tomorrow. You can do what you want today, but I hope that the process opens up and we can get started. And then y'all will actually look at each candidate that applies. A guy told me, how can they already be committed? Martin Luther King or Jesse Jackson or anybody could apply and they already committed. Eric, <clears throat> excuse me, you have five minutes, so please sum up. Back up open up the process, let's get this going, and let's try to do what's best for Flint. I'll help you out regardless if it's me, but sometimes people just can't do what you do. I want to help you and the city as well as myself. God bless. Thank you, Eric. Okay, our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Mr. Chris Adele Moroni. Thank you. My, thank you. My name is Chris Delmaroni, and I live in Flint, Michigan. A um, couple things. One is um, the, the border review. I, I sit on the border review. I'm actually the chairperson of the border review here for the city of Flint, and that's where taxpayers uh, uh, can appeal their property taxes to. Uh, we will be meeting on Tuesday, December 11th at, at 1 p.m. here. And for those uh, that wish to uh, appeal um, to the Board of Review, either as a veteran or for a poverty exemption, have until December 7th to do that. Um, in regards to the poverty uh, exemption, uh, it does not el eliminate um, the, let me call it the liability to pay property taxes. It can be reduced if one qualifies. And there are income limits as to uh, how many people live in the household based on the number of people that live in the household. So they'll look at 
the entire income of everyone living in that household. It has to be the uh, the primary re excuse me residents resident of the residents of the uh, individual appealing. Um, and, and I would like to remind council that council has the power to increase the amount of income per household, per individual. Uh, that's within the purview of the council. Our limit now is, I believe, higher than what the, the, the state allows for, but, but council has that authority. In regards to the veterans, and I'll just be real brief on a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, I would recommend anyone in either of these situations to uh, uh, contact the city assessor's office. The veterans are basically, if they have a disability from being in the service, they're honorably discharged, and they live in the home, and the VA benefits have had to, say, put in a handicap uh, <coughs> ramp for them to enter their home. Uh, they will qualify and they will not have to pay any property taxes whatsoever. When the veteran passes away, um, that benefit stays with the veteran's spouse uh, as long as they live in that home. So it, it's a, a great benefit to those who have served our country and to those who, uh, and, and on the other hand, for the others who uh, in the poverty exemption. So I would encourage those in, in those situations that uh, people that think they may apply or may fall into that situation to apply. Um, the, the other thing is, you know, I, I keep hearing so often about Smith Village and things like that. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a fan of Smith Village. And it just seems like the city should work to find out how they can get out from underneath that. That is costing our community so much money, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to imagine this project being successful at any point, even if all the homes are built and sold and occupied, uh, just because of the exorbitant cost. Um, I believe the city would have been much better, and it was my position to pay back the million dollars, a little bit more than a million dollars, and use the funds uh, for other projects in our community. Smith Village now has, is, has sucked up millions of dollars from our community. Uh, now we hear about vandalism and things like that, and my understanding is NSP money, which was going to Smith Village because it wasn't drawn down quick enough, is now being, let me say, diverted to other parts of the community, which is good. But the city is remaining committed to Smith Village, so that means either future programming money or general fund money will have to go towards Smith Village. And that's unfortunate. Smith Village, you know, I want to put it on the side of the equation with Auto World and Windmill Place and Water Street Pavilion and the Hyatt Regency I would also add to that side of the equation the Rutherford parking deck. Whatever our city can do to get out from underneath that obligation to back those bonds, um, we should really work towards that. Whether it takes to ask the city attorney what needs to be done or if the, um, Mr. Kurtz in his position right now can do anything about that. So the most important thing right now is for the residents. Uh, the Board of Review, again, it meets Tuesday, December 11th. The deadline is uh, Friday, December 11th to get those applications in. Thank you. Chris, before you take your seat, yeah. isn't also December the 11th uh, the time that the Board of Review uh, will make any corrections to any errors that were done during the Board of Review process? Is that also yeah. my understanding? I, yeah, and I think those will be automatic. You don't have to be there as an individual if there was an error, is that correct? Correct. Okay, yep. thank you. Ms. Kate. <clears throat> Anyone else? Yeah. Councilman Neely? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad Mr. Del Maroney came before us and, and spoke to the issue of the poverty tax exemptions. I want to remind the public that we will be holding at Prince of Peace Church on November 29th uh, poverty tax exemption uh, uh, informational session giving out those applications. Also, applications will be available from 6 p.m. until 8 p.m. that night. That's this upcoming Thursday. 
uh, for combining your parcels of property. If you have bought a side lot uh, to adjacent to your property, uh, you will be assessed for a street lighting assessment for that property. So one way to forego that, not in this taxable, this tax season or this tax year, uh, is to combine your parcel of property. So you could combine your side lot with the parcel of property where you reside at, and then it becomes one parcel. So in the future, you'll be only assessed for that street lighting assessments one time versus the two times. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Del Maroney to be present at Prince of Peace Church because he does sit on the review board uh, to make sure that eligible um, applicants can get their questions asked and answered so that application can be submitted to the city of Flint by de uh, December 7th. Also, the applications uh, due to combine your parcel of property inside the city of Flint is due November 30th. So if you are inclined to combine your parcels of property so you will not be uh, charged in excess for street lighting, uh, please go down to the second floor of City Hall to the Assessor's Division. Those applications will be available to you uh, today, tomorrow, whenever you decide to get there. But those forms do have to be submitted and turned in by November 30th of this year. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Mr. President. Anyone else? Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you. Thank you. While we're on um, the subject of street lights, I would like a referral. I know it probably won't be answered, but um, maybe if you send it to Mr. Koff and then also to uh, Emergency Financial. Yeah, Manager. him too. Okay. The 8th Ward, that's uh, Miller Road, and all of the mansions that go down towards the golf course, that's 8th Ward, right? Well, I have noticed in my travels, there's a lot of new lighting over <coughs> in that area. Nice, bright LDT lighting. Is that the new lighting that the city is supposed to have all over the city? Or is it just for that part of the city? And if that's not the money that um, they tax us for, then who's paying for all of that lighting over there? That's my question. I, I don't have that answer, but I'll be happy to make that referral. Well, to the if you're out tonight, I would suggest that you travel over there because that lighting looks just like these light bulbs here, all down from Miller Road all back where the mansions and all that pretty housing, my dream home, all that is back up in there, and it's lit up with brand new lighting. I'll make that referral in order. Thank you. Just, Councilman Nolan. Just one, one quick question um, related to the um, Board of Review. Um, I'm, I've also been getting a lot of calls from people that have um, multi-unit <coughs> property and the uh, um, the trash assessment, because if they have um, a multiple unit dwelling, it's still the same amount of trash is going out, but they're getting assessed for each unit. And um, I just find that to be very, very um, hard on some of the people that have multiple units. So would that be something that can also be brought up at the Board of Review as well? Um, I'm going to make that referral to the administration for you, Councilman Nolan, um, to find out if and that would be multiple units of four or less? Four, is that correct? Four, four or less. So multiple units of four or less. And they're getting assessed $135 are per getting, unit. Are getting um, special assessments for waste collection for each unit. When they don't have to make any more trips, they're still coming right. to the same, when, when um, no, same houses. When, when it's but one each stop. One, yeah, when each it's one, one getting, getting assessed. So that's, um, yeah, if you can make that referral. Because I, I would like to know um, so about that, that one. Without objection. Well, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. A.C. Dumas. Mr. Dumas. Good evening. Good evening, A.C. My name is A.C. Dumas, and I have a concern in reference to uh, Smith Village. Uh, as you may know or may not know, that I did ask the Department of Justice to come in and investigate Smith Vi Village, the Community Relations Service Bureau, and they did come in. 
and we met with uh, <clears throat> several uh, community representatives, uh, Councilman Lawler. Uh, he was the uh, representative because he is the councilman of council person of Smith Village. Ed Kirch did meet. Mike Brown did meet about Smith Village. And doing, I was concerned about the ongoing Smith Village, where are we at in this process? And I was uh, concerned about City of Flint following HUD guidelines. And I'm here to let you know today that the City of Flint may be paying back $2 million or millions of dollars for Smith Village. I had an opportunity on last week to speak with the that that developing company from out down by Detroit area, go, go, whatever the name is, and also Road Road Aids. I guess he's the one that's doing the work. I talked with him. I was very offended at his comment to me. He said, "No, we're not using Section Three contractors." Neither are we using Section 3 qualified workers. This is what he told me out of his own mouth. We have young men and young women that have qualified for Section 3 workers, and we also have contractors that have been qualified as Section 3 contractors by the city of Flint. And uh, it was sad that on a couple of weeks ago, one of the brick layers or the concrete gentleman, I know he does an excellent job because he did the concrete in the brick of our church, Harris Memorial, if you ever seen that, it's, it's beautiful. And he was on the job and the contract, general contractor, removed him from the job. And I got several calls. Well, it concerned me. He was an African American. And so when I made this call on Wednesday, uh, the general contractor told me, said, well, he was slow and the work was inferior. I got a call from the Department of Justice today and they asked me, did we want to continue with the community relation service? And I told them no, because that part of it is, a public relation part, and I'm not interested in public relations. Found out uh, that some, some individuals were told uh, no, they would not be able to work on that job. I called Tracy Atkins, I'm not gonna say millions, but a whole bunch of times. She don't return your calls. I think another gentleman by the name, uh, whatever his name is, uh, from- Dave Solis? No, uh, he's from uh, Access or something like that. Capital Access? Sure. Capital Access. Sure, Donaldson. Huh? Sure. Donaldson. It is his responsibility, his responsibility to monitor every activity as far as that construction. That's what we pay them for. He didn't do it. So when we got in this meeting, I asked Ed Kirch and Mike Brown, you know, what's going on? Well, the bottom line is that when we were, they barred Councilman Lawler from any meetings, any meetings at all. And he was on the committee, he was our representative. Ed Kirch barred him. He didn't know anything about your rep our representatives about that meeting. So well, I, I called Yvonne Chavez. She is the deputy director of HUD. And I asked that office, and I would ask the city council to come in and investigate. Because when Kurtz leave, the financial managers leave, guess what? We are gonna be hit for maybe a couple million dollars because we violated the HUD agreement for Section 3. Now, my community college. You're, you're five minutes, sir, but I'm going to give you a few more minutes to sum up. Thank so you. So that we can. Now, my community college was the, in, uh, the, the 
who was who was qualifying the Section Three workers, mm -hmm. and they've got a lot of them. I know the gentleman that did it, and uh, none of those individuals. We have some here. I think he'll they'll speak. Apprentices that were denied the opportunity to work on Smith Village. All the workers are staying out in Grand Blank. You go see the trucks. I saw one at, at Speedway while I was getting some gas. They come in and they leave out. And so I would ask this council to send a letter to HUD, the Deputy Director of Grants, Yvonne Chavez, and ask her to come and investigate Smith Village. So you'll see that Mr. Kurtz and them, they don't play with an even hand. They don't, they don't play that. They sell it all access, and when they go, guess who's going to hold the bag? We are. I'm finished. Thank you, Mr. Dumas. Councilman Lawler? Yes, uh, <coughs> thank you, AC, uh, for the work that you do in this community and uh, the support that you're giving uh, this Smith Village project. Um, Mr. Dumas is correct, uh, my council members, in that I was barred from any meetings uh, that it's in regards to Smith Village. Um, I was first invited by uh, the infrastructure director and then uh, Dave Solis and then once uh, emergency manager found out that I was invited to the meetings, he barred me from the meetings. Um, the section three requirements, uh, guideline requirements for hiring uh, at least 30% of the qualified um, local uh, minorities uh, to be hired on this project, I don't believe that it is being that that, that requirement is being is, is not being it is not being met, and uh, those are some of the questions that I have already asked, and I'm not getting any answers, and I'm not being uh, being barred from the meeting so that I can be a part of those discussions. Um, you know, that's uh, here again part of the dictatorship that we're under here in this city and uh, the type of control that uh, this current administration, uh, you know, think that they have on the residents of this city. Because I am the voice of the Fifth Ward and uh, uh, that Smith Village project, but it's a shame that I can't enter into the door to be a part of those discussions. Um, I sent two resumes, two applicants to uh, Mr. Croft, the infrastructure director that's over this project, uh, where these individuals are certified uh, meeting the Section 3 certifications. They went through uh, Mott College, got their certifications, and uh, have been trying to get employed, you know, in, uh, in, in, in a part of this project. Um, and I've made several, several follow-up calls regarding those applicants, as recent as last week. And I've tried other avenues as well, but here we are with a project that they qualify for, that they've gone through the, um, the, the requirements so that they can be uh, qualified, qualified applicants for that, and they meet the qualifications, and I can't get a response, and they can't get a response on their application. So I would agree that there's something wrong, that we're not meeting those qualifications. Um, I would say that we need to send a referral, but I, don't, I think the referral is just going to fall on deaf ears. Sending a referral to the emergency manager and to the infrastructure director um, in response to the Section 3 qualifications and if they're being met, and I would agree with uh, Mr. Dumas in that we need to send a communication to HUD to have them to come in and do the investigation that is needed and to give us a response on actually what's going on here in the city of Flint. Otherwise, unless somebody else on this body think that they can get the response that is needed, then I would implore you to you know, make that that request make that referral, but um, I mean it's it's hardball 
when you tell a city council person that's representing that ward, you're barred from meetings. I mean, that's, that's, that's hardball right there. And a total disrespect for uh, the residents of the city. So I would ask that we would send a letter uh, to HUD and ask them to come in uh, to investigate this matter because uh, we believe that the Section 3 requirements are not being met. I'll support that, Councilor Lawler. Thank you. All right. Um, and also, too. I, I just I want to just recommend um, something that, as, as the representative from that ward <clears throat> being barred from those meetings, um, you may want to contact um, our senators. Uh, Levin and Stabenow, and also Congressman Kildee, and uh, have them apply pressure from the top down, and we'll uh, apply uh, a letter of complaint to HUD from us uh, as a legislative body that under the emergency manager law that the emergency manager has circumvented the process by allowing elected officials to be engaged and involved in a project that's federally funded in the district that they represent. And I, I would think that that would catch the attention of Senator Stabenow and Senator Levin. So, Thank you. So do you, think, do you think that we should send a letter to um, Senator Levin and Stabenow? Well, I, I think first, to send a letter to HUD as a legislative body and as an elected official. I, I, I think, uh, thank you for that. And uh, as an elected official, I should send a letter to them as a representative from that, that, uh, that ward. So not, not only would I send a letter, but I would, I would recommend a phone call. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I would do both. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's just what I would do. But we can still send a letter to HUD as a body if you want, or you can do it as an individual. No, I think from, as a body, it, it gives more of a voice oh, right. uh, of this community. But I just wanted yeah. to offer that as a suggestion. Yeah. Just, just huh. one other thing, too. You know, I'm, I'm very appalled to find out that they're not honoring the Section 3 certification because that's something that we've talked about since we've been on council. <clears throat> and um, with all the demolition work and other things that's going here, that we wanted to make sure that we had Section 3 um, certified workers getting some of the work because we want to be in compliance with um, the federal guidelines. So um, it's going to be my suggestion also, too, we, we're going to have a leadership meeting later on this week um, with Ed Kurtz and, um, and Mike Brown, and I will make, uh, make sure that I, I address those concerns as well, and I'll get back with you as well, um, Councilman Lawler. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Councilman Lawler, I feel you. Trust me. I Young men of color come up from the gloom of national neglect you have already been paid for. Come out of the shadow of irrational prejudices. You owe no racial debt to history. The blood of our bodies and the prayers of our souls have bought for you a future without shame, bright beyond the telling of it. Kwanzaa means access. It means access to yourself. It means access to your people. Kwanzaa is like renewing your annual membership to community, to your family, to your culture, and most importantly, to yourself. Kwanzaa is expressed throughout the world now by people of African heritage who want to have that cultural connectedness. These are principles of what we're supposed to be doing 365, you know what I mean, and how we treat each other and how we look at the world. We did not petition or ask for permission to celebrate. We did it by Kuji Jakuli, a self-determination. Lead and Flint and proud of us. I'm Sophia Taylor and I am made right here in Flint, Michigan. Born and raised, rehabbing the hood and I'm proud of it. This is Gary Jones coming to you live from downtown Flint, and I'm made in Flint and proud of it. My name is John Wood. I'm made in Flint and proud of it. I'm Laura Panic. I'm making it in Flint and proud of it. I'm Molly Panic. I'm born in Flint. I'm making it in Flint. I'm staying in Flint, and I am proud hey, of it. Hey, Dwayne Younger, chilling out down here at the Buckham Alley Fest. Made in Flint and proud of it. Truman Marable, creator of Student of the Month, and I'm making 
sweat and proud of it. Good morning. I go to Evangelist Tiffany Church. Made it flint and proud of it. And also Congressman Kildee and uh, have them apply pressure from the top down and we'll uh, apply uh, a letter of complaint to HUD from us uh, as a legislative body that under the emergency manager law that the emergency manager has circumvented the process by allowing elected officials to be engaged and involved in a project that's federally funded in the district that they represent. And I, I would think that that would catch the attention of Senator Stabenow and Senator Levin. So, Thank you. So do you, think, do you think that we should send a letter to um, Senator Levin and Stabenow? Well, I, I think first to send a letter to HUD as a legislative body and as an elected official. I, I, I think, uh, thank you for that. And uh, as an elected official, I should send a letter to them as a representative from that, that, uh, that ward. So not, not only would I send a letter, but I would, I would recommend a phone call. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I would do both. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's just what I would do. But we can still send a letter to HUD as a body if you want, or you can do it as an individual. No, I think from, as a body, it, it gives more of a voice oh, right. uh, of this community. But I just wanted yeah. to offer that as a suggestion. Yeah. Just, just um, one other thing, too. You know, I'm, I'm very appalled to find out that they're not honoring the Section 3 certification because that's something that we've talked about since we've been on council <clears throat> and um, with all the demolition work and other things that's going here that we wanted to make sure that we had Section 3 um, certified workers getting some of the work because we want to be in compliance with um, the federal guidelines. So um, it's going to be my suggestion also, too, we, we're going to have a leadership meeting later on this week um, with Ed Kurtz and, um, and Mike Brown, and I will make, uh, make sure that I, I address those concerns as well, and I'll get back with you as well, um, Councilman Lawler. Thank you. Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Councilman Lawler, I feel you. Trust me. I, today, was in your ward just driving through. And I'm one that believes in seeing. And everything that <clears throat> Mr. A.C. Dumas got up here and said is really true. I kind of hung around as far as I could on the construction site because I didn't see anybody that looked like me. Not even the man that was holding the stop sign. <laughs> And I know that um, there is someone that's qualified in this city to hold a stop sign and be visible. So whenever you get your letter ready to go to the HUD, I will be more than welcome to support that letter. Because what I did, I'm one of these that, and always have been, I'm going to dig and see for myself. and. Um, I got out of my car, truck and parked it over by the party store on Martin Luther King. And I guess they didn't pay much attention to me. I just walked around as far down as I could. And I'm just looking and counting, waving it. They, I guess they thought, this woman got to be crazy. So I just wave at them, they wave at me. But there was no one that I saw that resembled me at all. So. I'm with you on this one. I think um, our city is being shortchanged. We don't have jobs as it is. And um, jobs that are coming, they're not considering those that are qualified, that live in the city, that need to feed their families just like they're feeding their families in the suburbs. So I'm with you because I've seen it for myself. And anybody else want to see it, it'll be there tomorrow. Got a brand new house going on right up there on the corner of um, uh, Martin Luther King and Williams. Is that Wood. Williams? Right Wood. there on a the big, pretty. Wood. What you know down there? Where, where, well, you go down there and see them too. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go see them. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. But I would suggest that, you know, just go take a look for yourself. Because it is true. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Anyone else? 
Okay, our next speaker this evening, Madam Clerk. Pastor William uh, Whitaker. Good evening, Mr. Good evening. President good evening. to this council. It's good to be here. You know, we always, I'm always hearing about transparency. And every time it comes to transparency, I can't get a response. I can't get a call. Person's on vacation. At Hasselbrink now, we're supposed to have an election process in December. The one that's over the advisory board has canceled the last three meetings which we were supposed to have on Wednesdays. He's promised them that they would not have or that we would not have the right, basically, to vote for whoever is going to be advisory board president. You have influence. I've told uh, Gerace, now do I have to get a lawyer or have a lawsuit when it can be settled? Whoever is the best person to be over the advisory board, because the term is up. For us to say yes or no, it doesn't have to be me. The other thing is, is that we have lost 30 some thousand dollars again because persons have not put the purchase orders in and the man was supposed to be able to get the work done. That's why I stepped down before we went to whistleblowers when we went through all the stages because they said he could get the work done. I had no problem because it's about the people it's about the center. The center is the largest center that people are there, and yet only thing that we do is eat and go to the theater. Everybody else, I guarantee you, out in Flushing, they are going to the Festival of Lights. There's more to it. It's our money, 70% comes out of, out of the city, Genesee County, and the extra money goes on the outside. In regards to the appointment of a person that represents the community, by and large, Hasselbrink does not support the one that Del Rico put there or is recommending. We are senior citizens. We have children, grandchildren, and we know what goes on in our community. I don't know why we keep getting held up. But ever since two and a half years ago, when we stopped $256,000, we have been the ones that's been the headache, the heartache, and all that. Mm -hmm. They changed the rules over at the county that we have to, but if we get back in or whatever, I guarantee you in 90 days that we will have the money already allocated and we will be going to other places. We just want our rights to be respected. We need someone to represent the community, the first ward. There are persons that are more qualified than the one you're recommending. It's bad when you have a councilman that only showed up three times in my two years there. When he showed up one time, we ended up with our director being lost because of his lie. I, Del Rico, I don't trust him. I remember when he first started, I'm going to represent the community. He has not represented the community. Smooth, operative, cool, calm. Oh, he's got that. Polished mouth politician, he's got that. I've already told him, I do not respect him because he does not hold up his word. Now, why would I want to recommend or accept someone that he sits up here and he has lied about representing the community? People have called him out of the center that loved him, and he never did call back when you leave a message for him right here. Now he's gone. Now we're going to have someone else come in and business as usual and taking money out of the North End and that community? Hey, I think not. But it may go. It might be just like they did Jesus with six trials before they executed him. Annas was in control, but Caiaphas was the front man. All of it is about dollars and cents. 
How in the world do you go to casino and the county pays for it and the city pays for it and you turn around and charge the people in the center $25, which is not supposed to be? Then I said before, this person said he can get anything he wants from downtown. I've almost seen that to be true. But guess what? It doesn't bother me. Only thing I, only thing I can do is let my voice be known represent those constituents in that community or wherever I go. Only thing that I want is to be fair. That's all. Mr. Whitaker, you've exceeded your Thank time. You. you can sum up. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Roy Fields. Mr. Mr. Fields. Fields. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Roy Fields. I'm 31 years old, reside at 3610 Brown Air Boulevard. I've been a resident here all my life. Parents been here all my life. Um, I am representing three hours urban reality. Um, can you hear me now? Yep. Right. Thank you. I was playing football this weekend. That's why I got the black eye. <laughs> but um, just here to just touch on a few things that my brother talked about. Um, you know, we represent this urban community. I mean, there you go. We seeing what's going on around here, and I mean, I come from a pretty good family. I wasn't, didn't come from a broken home. Good working parents. Um, father retired from General Motors. My mother still works at Hurley Hospital. And the things that I've seen since I've been home, I've been home seven years. I'm convicted felon. Um, it's tragic. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's hurtful, you know. Not to mention, I've been one to come home. I've kept a clean nose for two and a half years. I got off parole, maintained employment. Um, I'm also part of the Section 3, um, but there's still no employment. I'm inclined to tell you that the, the, whatever program that was set forth to give us the certification, it, we have it. We're not working. Smith Village, I mean, I was told I was going to be a part of that when it got here. But come to find out, I rolled down there and seen somebody from Grand Rapids that was there. I mean, I'm certified heating and cooling, electrical and plumbing. Um, I'm also an iron worker, Local 25 out of Novi. I'm an apprentice. Why am I not working? Or why do I have to categorize my life around six months at a time, seasonal? Unfortunately, um, I come from the generation that would never see $90,000 a year in the city of Flint, or even 80,000 for right now. I mean, it's just not feasible. Um, we have skills. I'm tired of getting treated like I'm a second-class citizen. I did my time. I caught my case when I was 20. I'm 31. I'm still dealing with it. I'm tired of it. You know, I take care. I pay my child support on time. I mean, I'm doing everything I think I can possibly do, right? And, I mean, other than me being self-motivated within myself and the people I'm surrounding myself with. That's the only thing that gives me hope every day, to keep me striving. That's the reason we started this, pro this program. We're trying to get it going with the help of you guys. Just some understanding that, you know, with these kids, they have no skills. I think that the majority of the toolage that we've got came from General Motors. Unfortunately, we ain't got that no more. It doesn't exist. Sad part about it, we have however big General Motors was, those are the tradesmen and skilled trades that you had within that shop. So it's skilled brothers around here, skilled people. They teach us this. But because I might have a strike against me because I'm a convicted felon, I can't even get to the door. They make programs where they set aside certain things for guys like us to get out and re-enter society, to learn, to show that we can be, become a productive citizen. But at the same time, um, I got out 2006, the NPRI program wasn't even implemented yet, so I came home with nothing. And once it got implemented, I was still on parole at the time, I went to Goodwill, nothing. They couldn't help me because I didn't fall under that category. I went to New Path, talked to Marlene Benjamin, gave her a few ideas, the people, things that could help me, nothing. I didn't fall up on the NPRI program. You know, I always said once I got enough money, I invest in the MDLC because that's the business I know would never go bankrupt. And it's sad because we have all these skilled workers here, all these skilled youth, 
we can't get to work. Sometimes I feel it's because, you know, the old shop workers, they so, so much trying to protect themselves and protect their livelihood because their pension getting cut, their medical getting cut. I mean, I understand that and I feel that. I got a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. I'm trying to provide for them. I can't. I mean, I, I can't. I'm tired of it. We have to go. I drive 600 miles a week to go to school and to work. I work in Detroit. If anybody ever been to Ann Arbor, I just helped build a 15-story loft down on University Drive. Why can't I help do that here? I worked for Goyette for two years. They laid me off. I worked for Johnson & Wood for two years. They laid me off. I stayed in a program at my, I got my, one of the certifications that I have come, ECAR, Energy Conservation and Apprenticeship Readiness. Well, anything, is, everything now is trying to go green. We're certified. Put us to work. I understand the city is in economic turmoil, these emergencies. Why well, shoot all these jobs to these companies and contractors everywhere else, and we stand around here starving? You know, and we wonder why the recidivism rate is so high. They don't give us nothing. We hungry. You know, and it's, I, I know I'm from the hood. I'm from right here. One of the few privileges to say my grandparents used to own that store down on Wood Street and Avenue A. It used to be called Geneva's. One of the few black-owned stores. I come from that era of generation of kids that grew up with a community care for one another. Um, your, your five minutes are up. Would you please sum up? Okay. Well, unfortunately, that you know we're here. Three hours. Reform. Refine. Or rebuild. Urban reality. We, just, we want to help. We need some help. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank job, you brother. very much. <laughs> Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Alex Harris. Mr. Harris. Madam Clerk, thanks for taking my late notice. <laughs> I remember when the bylaws were changed and how things were going So, anyway, we'll thanks. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Now, what I was going to say is I want you and anyone else on council to actually interrupt me if, if uh, some of the facts I put out or you know, alleged facts I put out may be incorrect. I'd welcome that uh, while I'm speaking. I know the city has a mountain of problems. We all know that. A mountain of problems. A myriad of issues that, you know, seem too daunting to, to succeed and overcome. And the fact of it is, there are probably a number of folks that wonder whether they should stay in the community. Whether they sit here, I don't know, or throughout this community, many people are confronted with the idea, how long am I going to keep banging my head against the wall? Things never seem to get better. And very honestly, you know, I'm pretty lucky. You know, life has dealt me some uh, dealt me some good turns. <sighs> Sorry, it's it made me makes me reflect on the city I was born in and have loved. I feel ashamed because I do have the personal means to desert, to leave, to live in much more affluent areas. And I do have property in other areas, but it isn't about me. We have a mountain of problems. We're stifling, what are we coming up on, the year anniversary? Was it the 1st of December he officially took over? Is yeah. that about right? Yes. Yeah, so we're just about the year anniversary of this wonderful latest takeover. Five days away. Five days. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, a mountain of problems seemingly without end, without answer, but very simply, there is nothing, nothing that confronts this community 
with greater peril than the crime issue. I know a lot of people have talked about it, me included, time and time again. But I'm having a hell of a time, excuse me, reconciling how we just passed another six mil tax increase. Maybe you don't know, we're right at the cap. We're right at the cap. We can't be taxed any further. Is that correct, Mr. President? Can't be taxed any further. We've reached, God bless you, God bless you. We've reached the cap. We're an uh, impoverished or less economically well community than most in this country. And yet we tax at the highest rates possible. And we seem to get less and less for those dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, we passed in good faith a tax millage. Again, please correct me if I'm wrong. Six mills amounted to what? 5.3, 5 million 300 and some thousand dollars. And, and I feel comfortable if anyone wants to correct me on council. If you literally devoted that money to hiring police officers, putting cops on the streets of the city of Flint, you'd have over 60 positions available. 60 more police officers on the city streets. And I don't want this to be taken wrong, but I don't look at things in black and white. I mean, race-wise, you know, not, I, I'm a very simple person and I tend to see things in certain ways. So when I say black and white in that way, I don't mean black and white in the way we all like to think. I don't care if a dead person, a murdered person is black or white. I see a human being, a human being that was cut down and shorted from their life. And all the effects their family and friends and all in their community who loved them, cared about them. We are being undermined every day. We carry a murder rate if it was extrapolated, I've said this before. If the murder rate yearly in Flint per capita was extrapolated to New York City or Chicago or LA, in New York City, there'd be over 5,000 murders in a year if you compared it to what Flint has based on its population. Alex, you, you've exceeded your five I minutes. Know. I know. I'll give you a couple minutes it, it, to I'll sum up. I'll try to please. be more timely. Thank you. What I'm getting at and what I spoke to my good friend, my dear friend, my council person from the seventh ward. And please, ladies and gentlemen, don't get me wrong. I know that most of the killing takes place in other parts of the city. I'm not minimizing how terrible it is to live in fear and hear gunshots in your neighborhood and be laying on your bedroom floor wondering if a bullet's going to hit your children or your family members. That's far worse than what I experience in my more affluent area. But my more affluent area is deteriorating as well. And I tell you, much of the tax base comes from areas like that. Now again, this isn't a playoff of with black and white. It's a reality, economic reality. We can't continue to lose our tax base and afford any of the services that make the quality of life that we all want. So I say to you, my friends on city council, I know, as one of my dear friends on council just said, you're impotent, you feel like you're powerless. I, I know some of you probably don't want to continue in your job and one is left. I know the realities. I'd be just as frustrated. But I tell you, we got to try. We got to fight. And as I said, as I said to my friend in the seventh ward, there are things, there are, in our neighborhood alone, we have active patrolling of good citizens that try and do everything possible on their own resources. They, they have photographs of, of criminals wandering around, young punks that are B&Eing and, and intimidating and threatening people, even when people check them and know that they're ready to commit a, a burglary. They, 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 threaten them, Alex, and then they end up taking Alex, action. I'll wrap it up, I thank promise. You. Thank you. I promise, Mr. President. <clears throat> Here's the bottom line. Just like the thing that A.C. Dumas so eloquently outlined with Smith Village, 
which, you know, I have my thoughts on the wisdom of ever embarking on a federal project like that, but nonetheless, the people of that ward in this city deserve better. What I say is, please, with the united voice of the city council, try and force this crowd to listen, to not just spend, was it 10 positions they're prepared to spend the money for when they had the money for over 60? 10! And through attrition, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be lucky if we don't go below zero. We'll lose officers. So the bottom line is this. We must, as a community, insist on police officers, more police officers. We paid, in good faith, over $5 million for more police officers. Let's demand that we get them. And I hold you to, and I don't mean that in a negative way, let us have that meeting. I will not mince any words, as you know, with the all and powerful Oz. Alex, please. Listen. Thank you. Thanks for indulging me. Please, as a council, step forward. You're not going to make progress until you answer this critical issue. Mr. President. Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you. Alex, I feel exactly like you do. And I was one of those that tried my humblest best to explain to people that they were being hoodwinked, carjacked, police jacked, and every other kind of jacked by Mr. Kurtz and Mr. Brown. But there is a man, I do believe, that is on a committee that Mr. Kurtz and Mr. Brown formed, and he is a pastor, and I believe his name is Pastor Stokes, in his commercial where he was pleading for you to vote for these police officers, that he was on a committee that was going to oversee and make sure that Mr. Kurtz and Mr. Brown stood up to the plate and got your police officers, that the money was going to be spent the way they were begging you to vote for it so they could get it. So I would suggest that every person in this community either call, write, or knock on the door of Pastor Stokes, since he is the only one that seems to be able to talk to Mr. Kurtz, and we cannot get through to him. But Mr. Stokes, in his commercial, Yes. Family worship center. Family worship center. Is it family worship it's center? Fine. That's the name of the church. Call uh, your local um, operator, cell phone operator, whoever you need. Get that phone number and make sure that what he said in those commercials to get you to vote for that millage that he is the one can give you the answers, and he seems to be the, one of the overseers that's going to oversee that Mr. Kurtz and Mr. Brown spends our money correctly. Because trust me, I did everything in this world in my power to make sure that people were not hoodwinked, because I know exactly what they were doing. They mean us no good, they're doing us no good, and we're getting deeper in debt. And while I'm saying that, President, Mr. President, mm -hmm. um, Heidi, the one, the young lady that used to come and um, give us uh, information at our uh, Wednesday meetings, Yo, you know who I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, from the land bank. From the okay, yep. Miss Heidi from the land bank. Mm -hmm. I happened to be at a fair with her, and there was a study done by a group out of Detroit. And the blight problem in the city of Flint, I may not see it in my lifetime taken care of. It happens to be $50 million. It is a $50 million problem. And how we're going to take care of this, I have not a clue. Because the little 4 to $5 million that they claim the government gave them to start blight elimination is not going to make an eyelash bat. So I don't know when they're going to let the community know that we have an actual $50 million blight problem in the city of Flint, and it is growing, because I have three neighbors that have just left our fair city. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
I, I was told, and I, I don't know this for a fact, Mr. Harris, but I was told that I believe Pastor Stokes lives in the seventh ward. So I think he is a seventh ward constituent. But I'm not positive, but I was told that. I'm sorry? Mr. Council President, will you reiterate at some point, I know it's out of uh, the proper decorum, exactly what you expect the fiscal situation to be? It was very telling when I heard it from you, uh, from your lips some time ago. The audit? You would articulate the audit? how much progress we allegedly have or haven't made and what the expected deficit after one year of this uh, management. Um, you can just double down on um, the deficit. When uh, the emergency manager took over in uh, December, yeah. uh, four months into the budget year, five months into the budget year, we had a, we had an audited eight eight point one or eight point two million dollar deficit, and we're going to be at more than sixteen million um, in the next couple weeks when the audit's released. So. Preliminary um, reports are that the audit for the year that um, Mike Brown was here as the emergency manager, uh, the, the uh, deficit has doubled in the city of Flint. So, um, real progress when you're making $170,000 a year. Thank you, sir. Our next. Mr. President, oh, thank Hopper. you. It was brought to my attention the telephone number for the Family Worship Center. Pastor Stokes, 232-0470. Once again, 232-0470, Family Worship Center on Flushing Road, Pastor Stokes. He was the spokesman for the commercial for the millage for the police. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our last speaker is Mr. Robert Johnson. Mr. Johnson. <clears throat> After Alex, that's hard to follow. And he took the police thing. But that's okay. Hey, um, people are asking me, in which I can't answer. Um, I go through this public or the 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 um, Act 72 of 1990, and they keep wondering why we aren't getting rid of some of these people that uh, that are taking all our money. And I've been saying for months, fire them, you know, fire them, and it keeps being brought up to me that um, we can't fire them. And I'm going, well, wait a minute, um, we can't fire Mr. Kurtz. But you're telling me that nobody in the city of Flint has been fired at all since Mr. Brown took over? I mean, nobody? Now, I've been to many different council meetings. I went to Mount Morris Township Council meeting, been to Flint Township Council meeting. I've been to... Um, Metamora, I believe it was, um, we did a, a thing out there, and anyway, I ended up at their council meeting, different things, public things that I do, and I noticed that every single time I've gone to their council meetings, we had a, they had, they had a city attorney sitting in that spot. Every meeting, every single time. Now, I've rarely seen the man in the building when we had council, period. You know, he's supposed to be here protecting the city. And every time that the council had a question in them other places, they could turn to their city attorney. And he was sitting right there. And he could answer or say, I will find out for you and write it down. We don't have a city attorney. The man's getting paid but he's absent from duty every time I see it. Why can't we fire Mr. Bade? Period. Mr. Bade is not doing his job. He is not protecting us once so ever. 
Mr. Bade is sticking up for him. Every time you guys ask him for anything, he never responds back to you. Is that his job? I mean, isn't it? Isn't it his job to make sure that, that this public act 72 is followed and that our city charter is followed? Isn't it Mr. Bade's job to make sure that we're protected, the people of Flint are protected from being over taxed and overdone this way and that way. I mean, he, he's there to follow the laws. And he's here to tell you guys, hey, you're not following the laws. Hey, you're following the law. But for some reason, Mr. Bade is not available or not answering anybody. Now, when I went to Mr. Bade and asked him for certain things in which the law says that I have a right to do, in which it was all dealing with the ombudsman's office, which they illegally closed, which Mr. Bay did not fight for whatsoever, then he said, nothing I can do. It's his job to do that. It's his job to file the lawsuits against these guys and, and stop them. Our charter says we're supposed to have these services. We don't have them. Act 72, I see nothing in here saying that we cannot fire someone that is not doing their job. I mean, everything I've read in here, he's allowed to make appointments, in which that kind of stinks. I don't understand why he would be allowed to do that. His job is to come in and decide the financial stability of the city and come up with a solution. Well, so far their solution, as Mr. Um, President has just said, has cost us way more money. I mean, period. So how are you guys going to handle that, I you know, don't know. But I want to know why we can't fire Mr. Bade. First, outright fire Mr. Bade for not protecting the city as he should. None of you will answer. Well, we'll respond at your end of your comments. OK. There was a comment made about the crime which you all know why I'm here. You know what brought me to the city. And I keep seeing it over and over again. I would like somebody to make a formal complaint to the prosecutor's office. We pay the prosecutor's office tons of money to protect us. And to this day, he lets too many murderers go. He lets too many drug people go. Now he's an elected official, so that's a little more difficult. We'd have to recall him. Since he was just elected, then we have to wait six months to do a recall and so on and so forth. However, if he's not doing his job, in which I can point out case after case where there was, there was crack cocaine, there was other situations where he could have made the arrest, but he patted him on the back and let him go. Mr. Johnson, you've exceeded your five minutes. Will you please sum up? Right. Thank you. I would ask you guys to ask the, the prosecuting attorney's office, David Layton's office, why they are letting these criminals go without any kind of, any kind of charges. And you know, you keep on saying that the city is worse and we need to get rid of the crime. Well, we can't get rid of the crime if the county's not working with us in, in getting rid of the people that are doing the crime. Please come up with an answer on Mr. Bade because he Thank needs you. to go. Thank you. Mr. President. Uh, Councilwoman Poplar. Mr. Johnson, I would suggest that you contact um, State Attorney General, Mr. Schutte, that is he, and um, file a formal complaint against the prosecutor's office over there. I would suggest that you do that. Uh, Mr. Mr. No, you, you can talk after the meeting with uh, Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you. Any other uh, comments for Mr. Johnson? Okay. That concludes our speakers for this evening. Uh, we, we have no resolutions to act on. Um, but we do have one discussion item that I want to talk to real quick. I know Councilman Wayhill has to leave. And that is the um, appointment in the uh, filling of the position for the first ward. Um, I think it's 
uh, this body's decision on how to move forward, I have asked the clerk to prepare a uh, press release for tomorrow to accept applications of interest for the um, appointment of the first ward council seat and to have those in by Friday of this week. Uh, once those applications come in, then it will be up to us to review those applications uh, because I think uh, if at all possible we should try to make the appointment on December the 10th at our next regular um, scheduled council meeting. So that's the instructions that I've asked the clerk to do for tomorrow. Wanted to wait till we had this meeting tonight to make sure everybody was in accord with that and to discuss um, that process. So, Councilman um, Nolden. Um, I definitely would agree with that, and I think that would be the fair and equitable way to do it. I would also suggest that once we do that and we receive the, um, the um, applications for those interested in the position, that um, we as a body schedule an interview process. And it's my suggestion that um, we schedule for either Wednesday or Thursday of next week to give us an opportunity to be able to look at them. And then um, we can schedule um, an interview. And I would prefer to do it on just one day. And we start at maybe 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. And we just do that process during that time, if that's agreeable with my colleagues. And I think that that would be um, the best way to do it. And then we'll come back on the 10th of December and then we can make our, um, our decision at that time. I support well, that. One, one of the things that we've done to try to shorten the list um, in previous applications for positions, the ombudsman, council person, because if we get a big long list, if you don't want to interview everybody, um, council members um, would select three or four or five individuals that they wanted to go through the interview process submit them to the clerk so the clerk then could notify them and set up a schedule of those individuals that want to be interviewed. Now, in, in some cases, we haven't done interviews either for the position to fill a position. Um, and I'll give you a, a recent one. When Councilperson Cook left, um, the council appointed uh, Councilman Freeman without going through the interview process. Um, it was a good appointment. I think all the appointments we made have been good appointments. So I'm just saying that because if we get 25 or 30 individuals to be interviewed and you take 15 minutes at a, at a time, um, you, you know, what, it's the wish of the body on how they want to proceed. No, I, it's not I would, up to me. I would, I, would, I would like to suggest that um, we go through the interview process, but we schedule them at 20-minute intervals. On, on whatever day we decide to do it, but I would like to do all of the interviews on one particular day because, you know, we have to work around people's schedule. So that, that would be my suggestion, either Wednesday or Thursday of next week, and we start maybe 9 o'clock in the morning and we finish up the process um, that day. And, you know, those that can attend um, should attend, and those that can't, we can give our recommendations, and then we can move forward on the 10th if, if, if we're in agreement. And I know Councilman Lawler did um, second the motion, so I would, I would just offer that suggestion, um, 20 minutes, interviews, and we can do it on um, either Wednesday or Thursday of next week. And those 20 minutes for each person that applies, or are you going to narrow the list prior to the meeting? Um, I would say... Um, The ones that apply. Okay. I, I, I would say the ones that apply to, to make sure that it's it's fair and equitable for everybody because if, if they um, if they fit the criteria, so and I think that we can actually figure that out during the interview process if they fit that criteria and then bring back the recommendations or you know have a discussion with us either through email or phone calls and then um, that Monday we can go ahead and. Um, and um, pick the person that we feel is most qualified. Just a suggestion. Well, I, I, I heard your suggestion offered as a motion, and I believe Councilman Lawler supported it. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, in that, in that uh, we select next week, Wednesday or Thursday, to have the actual interviews, but um, that 
that wasn't a part of the motion was not in that um, that we would not narrow down the process of, of individuals um, being being interviewed. I think that we can communicate amongst each other and uh, set up those interviews for next week for Wednesday or Thursday. Okay, so I don't follow what you just said. So are you going to narrow it down or you're not going to narrow it down? Because you said there was a motion, but I not said we can communicate the that we were going to among each other yeah. and select the individuals that apply for the position. We can select them to set them up with an interview through the clerk's office. You're, we're going to we're going to communicate and make a decision without being in an open open meeting because that would be a round robin type um, violation of the Open Meetings Act. So if you all are going to decide, don't include me in that because I don't want to be part of that violation. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure none of us want to be a part of a violation of uh, that's any. What I'm trying of, to understand of what any, you're but we communicate in emails, and I can pull up some emails. Mm -hmm. If you'd like, uh, with your communication Not and emails, and I'm just, I'm just simply saying. Not where we've made a decision. Those that, well, that's not true either. True. Those, those that, applicants that submit to apply for the position, uh, we can narrow down Wednesday or Thursday, and with the clerk's office, those that will be interviewing based on what's been submitted to the clerk's office. I got Councilwoman Poplar and then Councilman Wayhill. Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you, Mr. President. What makes this communication any different than other communications that are called back door deals? What makes this so different? I, I mean, I think myself, I think we should decide tonight the process so the individuals that apply um, Thank understand you. what the process is going to be and that there's going to be a notification. I mean, if we select, and I'm just using this as an example, if 25 people submit interest for the first ward and collectively we only pick those 10, those other 15 are going to have to be notified. So we got to make sure that there's a no notification that those individuals are not going to be interviewed on Wednesday or Thursday. And so, I mean, we need to be in the open to decide the thank process. You. Thank you. Um, I'm not here to decide the individuals, but I think that's what we need to do moving forward. Councilman Wayhill. Um, as I read the clerk's memo, we have one, two, three, four, five individuals, at least as of, I guess this is today's date, that yes. have put in for this? That's correct. Do we anticipate that we're going to have up to 25, 30, 50 people, or do we think it will be a reasonable number on the lines of 6 to 8 to 10? My view is that we should, if, if every, everyone that applies who meets the criteria under the charter to be the council person from that ward um, should be interviewed. Mm -hmm. um, and if we have 50 people apply, maybe we only do five minute interviews. If we have 10 people apply, maybe we can have 15 minute interviews. But I think everyone should be treated equally. Mm -hmm. And a, a vague notion of the eight of us communicating via email or by phone or what have you between now and then to determine who's in and who's out doesn't satisfy that doesn't satisfy me so um, I would say interview everyone who applies by whatever the deadline is if the clerk verifies them as meeting the criteria under the charter mm -hmm. to be the member of council from that ward they should receive an interview and we base the number of minutes that that interview takes on the number of applicants okay. and I would also say that each council member has a certain amount of time to ask questions within the overall time because we can't have one council member asking all the questions. Everyone's got to have an equal shot. So each council member, I believe, needs to be timed in terms of asking questions. 
So that, those are my two cents. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Clerk. Mr. President, to really go along with what Councilman Wayhill is saying, in 2008 when we filled the first ward position before, we had nine people totally apply and we interviewed all nine of those individuals. And we did exactly, even though he wasn't on council at the time, I don't think, okay? But, but that's kind of how we did it. And looking at it historically from other uh, interviews that we've had in the past, we usually don't go over 10 people in terms of applicants and so forth. Okay. okay. All right. So I, I'm gonna recommend, or I'm not gonna recommend, I'm gonna recognize the motion by Councilman Nolden that is to uh, hold interviews on Wednesday, Wednesday oh, starting Wednesday. at 9 a.m. Um, and the time period will be based on the total number of applicants, but all applicants will be interviewed. Okay. Is that correct? Yes. Can you support that? Is that can I get support for that motion? Support. Okay, it's been moved and supported. Are, are you comfortable with that, um, um, Councilman Lawler? Um, you know, I work uh, in human relation issues and human resource uh, issues and personnel for, for many years. And there's, um, there's, there's no uh, negligence in us setting the criteria. So I'm just hoping that this is based on past history, that there will be no more than 10 individuals because it's not fair, it's not a fair process if we're gonna do an interview for five minutes. You cannot ask the questions and be able to get a, a good response from the candidates in five minutes. So if we do the interview of all the individuals, we may need to set it for another day, maybe that Thursday, as well as that Wednesday, if it's more than 10 individuals because five minutes is not going to be enough time. Well, let's set a minimum, a minimum time that we'll interview each applicant so that each applicant knows that there's gonna be a minimum time and let's set it for like 15 minutes. Um, hmm. I mean, I think 15, yeah, 15 minutes minute interview um, for someone to come in for 15 minutes and present to us their um, qualifications and their reason for wanting to serve as the first ward council's person, and then for us to ask questions after that, I think that's sufficient enough time for someone to present their resume to, to the council. I mean, do, do you agree with 15 I, minutes? I agree with 15 minutes for the 10 or less, but if it's more than that, we will probably need to set another date. Okay. So we'll start it on Wednesday, and you recommend that if we didn't get done Wednesday, we'd do it on Thursday? Yes, and, and, I'm available. And do it Thursday? So we'll do them Wednesday and Thursday of next week. If more if than we 10 more than on Thursday. If there's more than 10. Okay. Yes, okay. That's, that's good with me. Okay, so I'll recognize it as a motion being supported. Open process. All in favor or roll, Madam Clerk. Ms. Poplar? Yes. Mr. Nolden? Yes. Mr. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Lawler? Yes. Mr. Neely? Yes. Mr. Wayhill? Yes. Mr. Kincaid? Yes. Okay. That takes care of that important issue. Next, um, we have no ordinances for first reading or second reading. I had a question, Mr. President, before Mr. Freeman leaves. We, we have no um, ordinances for first reading or second reading. And we have no resolutions, and I don't believe there are any appointments. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? That's correct. Um, our next regular meeting will be on December the 10th at 5.30 p.m. Are there any council persons wishing to speak at this time? Councilman Neely, I see you. Not in your head like hey, hey, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kincaid. Like you're ready. So. Yeah. Well, I just had to just, uh, just I wanted to address a concern from a resident 
Mr. Johnson did raise a concern about our city attorney. Can, can we have a little order? Alex, please, we're, we're still conducting a meeting. Thank you. I did want to address a concern from a resident as they approached the microphone and, and had some uh, discussion as it relates to our city attorney. But just to point out the fact that a little over a year ago that our city attorney, uh, Peter Bade, had said that he represents the entity of the city of Flint, that it was his job to protect the city of Flint itself as an entity. Uh, at that time, he was, um, he was forwarding or not forwarding information to council members and or as, as a body as it related to an uh, energy grant that was lost over a million dollars. Subsequently, the city of Flint has lost that energy grant and it plays a, that plays an important part to this discussion because as we talked about the street lighting assessments and different things, uh, we could have used those dollars for LED lighting and different things of that nature to minimize the, the cost to residents throughout the city of Flint. But our city attorney then uh, has still not provided the type of legal responsibility that he has to this body and or the residents of the city of Flint. And your question, can we fire the city attorney? I don't know the legal answer to that. But when we had control, we did have an opportunity to remove him or alleviate him from his responsibility and his, and his duties. But I would ask this body to reach out to the city attorney to ask, uh, to make a, a written request to the city attorney if he can't be here to have someone here to help furnish answers and guidance to this body will be greatly appreciated by me from this council seat as I represent the constituents in the sixth ward. We do need some legal assistance in doing so. Uh, and especially as it relates to the Public Act 4, Public Act 72, and where this community stands. He made a pledge and a commitment saying that he would represent the entity of the city of Flint. Due process was never given to this community under PA 72. We were never afforded the opportunity uh, to have an appeal under PA 72, nor to see if we qualify to be under PA 72. So therefore, uh, having that person in the, in the seat at this time is very important. So I would ask this body to make the recommendation, well, I make the recommendation to send a letter to the law department asking for somebody to be in that seat so they can answer these questions and provide the assistance needed to represent and protect the entity of the city of Flint. Thank you. Okay. And you want that letter signed by everybody or do you want to send that letter we, we on just, your own? No, I don't need to send anything on my own because we work as a body, and I think it's uh, important for us to send a letter asking, requesting. Is that a motion? Um, it's not. Can a we all sign it. We, just can we make a request as a body? Can you make a request as a council president to ask for somebody on to be in that seat on behalf of the body? Well, I've, or, or, I've, I've asked for them to have an attorney here. I've talked to them about having an attorney here. Well, it hasn't done any good. So send in the letter. Mm -hmm. Just by me, is it going to do any more good? No, then? on behalf of, well, I'm making a motion to send a letter on behalf of the body requesting somebody uh, okay. be present here, and we can Support. also okay. forward it to uh, That's fine. Mr. Kurtz as I, well. I just want to make sure, Sean. Okay. Okay. Uh, next. Um, you made a motion. We, we got a motion. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's... Yeah, it's been moved and supported. Um, roll, Madam Clerk. Mr. Nolan? Yes. Mr. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Lawler? Yes. Mr. Neely? Yes. Mr. Wayhill? Yes. Mr. Kincaid? Yes. Is Ms. Poplar gone? Yeah, Jackie had to leave okay, to pick the, up her grand. The vote is uh, six yes, zero no. Mr. President, I, I need to leave to get to a Mott College trustee meeting, right. which started a couple minutes ago, so I would like to be excused. Yep, you can, and just before you leave, um, I made the appointments for the committees, not that it's gonna matter, I don't believe. And since Del Rico left as government ops, and you're not the vice president, I was going to see if you do government ops. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to tell you that before you left. Thank you. I'm sorry. He's government ops chair. Anyone else have anything? I, I do want to I do. make the uh, committee appointments. Um, Josh Freeman will be finance chair. I'll be vice chair. Dale will be uh, government ops, and Mike Sargentson will be vice chair. Bryant Nolan will continue to do grants, and Bernard will be vice chair. Jackie will do legislative, and Sheldon, I didn't get a chance to talk to you today. Would you be vice chair of legislative? 
and then that completes the appointment. So, can we get the list? I'm sorry. Can we get the list? From yeah, I'll give you the list. Okay. Absolutely. Any other business? Before yes. Um, I just had a question uh, to Councilman Freeman. Some months ago, uh, we collected money from the council, taking a picture of the uh, council, and we just hadn't heard anything else about it. Uh, can you give us an update on? It's in my the office. The picture was taken, and I has it. It's in my office. Oh. Okay. Sorry about that. It's just. Will it be? We, we're going to have it mounted. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? We are adjourned. from the gloom of national neglect you have already been paid for. Come out of the shadow of irrational prejudices. You owe no racial debt to history. The blood of our bodies and the prayers of our souls have bought for you a future without shame, bright beyond the telling of it. Kwanzaa means access. It means access to your soul. It means access to your people. Kwanzaa is like renewing your annual membership to community, to your family, to your culture, and most importantly, to yourself. Kwanzaa is expressed throughout the world now by people of African heritage who want to have that cultural connectiveness. These are principles of what we're supposed to be doing 365, you know what I mean, and how we treat each other and how we look at the world. We did not petition or ask for permission to celebrate. We did it by Kuji Jakuli, a self-determination. Lead and Flint and proud of us. I'm Sophia Taylor and I am made right here in Flint, Michigan. Born and raised, rehabbing the hood and I'm proud of it. This is Gary Jones coming to you live from downtown Flint and I'm made in Flint and proud of it. My name is John Wood. I'm made in Flint and proud of it. I'm Laura Paddock. I'm making it in Flint and proud of it. I'm Molly Paddock. I'm born in Flint. I'm making it in Flint. I'm staying in Flint and I am proud hey, of it. Hey, Dwayne Younger, chilling out down here at the Bucket Valley Fest. Made in Flint and proud of it. Evangelist Temple Church, made in Flint, I'm proud of it.